All right, get in your seats. Let's get going. Today we're finding sheer capacity of our perforated shear wall, hold down forces, and sill shear and tension forces. And I gave that a little star because this is a little additional tidbit that you need to design for when designing your perforated shear wall. So stick around to the end for that because that's a that's a little one that uh, can get overlooked because you don't need to do that for other systems. Dimensioning, as you can see, digest all that. I'm rolling with the 2015 edition. I know the 2021 is out. Uh, you should be using that for your designs for, for modern uh, code compliant structures, but I just don't have my hands on it yet. When I do get it, you'll see we convert over with videos moving forward here, but I think you're gonna get the gist of the example problem and be able to apply that to the updated code. And there are some twists and different things within that code, so stay sharp. Well, first, can we even use a perforated system? I get that in the design example, of course we are, because we're gonna go through it. But in the real world, you may not know if you are or are not permitted to use it per code. So you can't just use it whenever you want and make the numbers work. There are certain criteria you need to detail out uh, for your shear wall in order to be permitted by code to use the system. So let's go through that check. Is the total height of your shear wall less than 20 feet? Eight and eight is 16 feet. So we are, let's go green. We are within that criteria. The same elevation along the top of your shear wall, 16 feet all the way across flat surface, we are good to go. For instance, if you had a geometry where your roof slope did something like that and you had a shear wall located there, that would not be permitted for a perforated shear wall. And there was you know, an opening and it was perforated. Openings not permitted at ends. This one is kind of intuitive. If you had an opening, and there's a post here, if you had an opening over here in your wall, you can't be saying, oh, I'm gonna use this total length as my shear wall, uh, which makes sense. I mean, in reality, you really need to be using that as your shear wall. And your hold down would then go there and there, and you, it will, and let's say there's another opening right here. There's no openings at our ends, so we're good. And they actually give you a cap here. So they say your, your maximum shear capacity is limited for seismic application to 1,740 PLF and for wind to 435 PLF. So we will keep that in our back pocket and we're going to use that at the end to compare it against our capacities that we derive. And the walls must be fully sheathed around openings. So makes sense. Step two, check your aspect ratios. And this is aspect ratios of your wall segments. So not the full wall, uh, because this isn't a solid wall, this is a perforated wall. Well, we are unblocked today. And really having a blocked or an unblocked shear wall only pertains to when you're going through these checks of your aspect ratios. It doesn't affect the capacities of shear values that you get from the tables because for shear walls, they don't distinguish between blocked and unblocked like they do for the diaphragm tables. We're gonna call this panel one. We're gonna call over here panel two. And then this one, because there's a void below it, we can't, uh, we can't use it as part of our lateral system. So aspect ratios are H over B, H being the height, B being the width of each panel. So let's go plug all those in. This is for panel one, this is for panel two. We'll compare aspect ratios to the table provided, 434. And we are structural wood panels unblocked. So our H over BS maximum is permitted as two over one. 1. 1.6 is less than two. So we're clear here. Oh shit. Uh, uh, okay. All right, scratch that. We all make mistakes here. Happy little mistake. Psych. We are, where did I give that information? We are not gonna go unblocked. This is gonna be a blocked shear wall. So with a blocked shear wall, it is not 2.0. Your aspect ratio is permitted to be 3.5 as a maximum. Still works. So if it was unblocked, you could see that panel wouldn't be permitted to be used as a shear wall. So you would only have that one panel moving forward. Uh, I don't wanna do that in this example. So now there's additional criteria per this bidwiz for perforated shear walls. And you'll find that information in 4343, aspect ratios for perforated shear wall segments. So we did this first chunk up here with the aspect ratio, but then there's additional criteria down low here. So in the design of perforated shear walls, the length of each perforated shear wall segment with an absolute uh, aspect ratio greater than two to one shall be multiplied by two BS over H for the purpose of determining LI and summation of LI. I'll go blue here. So we are still for panel one, less than 2.0. So we are good there. But in this case, 
our aspect ratio is greater than 2.0, which means we need to modify this moving forward. And you'll see how we do that here. Step three, find our nominal shear capacity. Well, for perforated shear walls, there are three variables that we need to find in order to get this value. They're as follows. V sub S is the value that we, we pull from the shear capacity tables in this bid whiz. Summation of LI, so this is the sum of your shear wall segments in a perforated shear wall uh, after all modifications have taken place. And then C sub O, which is your adjustment factor based on the geometries of the openings in your uh, perforated shear wall. Well, we have them in order here. Let's solve for V sub S first. Let's say we have the following sheathing criteria. I think this is a pretty standard shear wall nailing pattern. We find ourselves in table 43A for wood-based panels, which we have. We're structural one sheathing type, 7 sixteenths, we're 8D nails, four inch edge, V sub S lands us right here, 790 PLF. And uh, of course we're under seismic application. So 790, but let's make sure we read all of our footnotes. It's really important here. Uh, this one basically just says, hey, you need to adjust the table uh, values above if you're using uh, in order to get it into an ASD capacity or an LRFD capacity, where ASD, which kicks you over to an omega equaling 2.0. So we will use that, you'll see. Footnote two, uh, per, uh, shears are permitted to be increased when showing, uh, when you're using a 15 over 30 second inch thick sheathing panel. We're using 7 16 so that one doesn't apply to us. Number three is uh, based on the specific gravity of your framing of your shear wall. Well, ho, 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 remember, I gave us a G equal to 0 0.4 in our problem. Well, that means we need to plug in and adjust our table capacity with the, uh, with the adjustment factor that comes out of plugging G into this equation. So we will do that uh, back at our problem as well. Uh, four is talking about apparent stiffness, so that's uh, nothing we need to be concerned about right now. Five, moisture content, a framing greater than, we don't have to worry about that if we're in a controlled uh, environment where we don't hit any of those extremes. Uh, we're panels, number six, panels applied at both faces. We're single-sided shear wall here today. And then seven, galvanized nails shall, uh, shall be hot dipped or tumbled. All right, so uh, that's just detailing criteria. This adjustment factor gets us 0 0.9, and the footnote continues to say that this factor shall not be greater than 1.0, so you could never use it to your advantage to increase the values provided in the table. It only takes a hit and decreases your values based on the type of wood species that you're using. So 0 0.9, let's say, is less than 1.0. Okay, so we met that criteria. That means Vs that we pulled of 790 PLF needs to be multiplied by that adjustment factor from note three. And we need to use an adjusted capacity of 711 PLF. All right, that's V sub S. That's our nominal unit shear. Let's find summation of our lengths of our panels. L1 is equal to 10 feet and L2 is equal to six feet. However, when we were going through our aspect ratio checks, we need to modify the length of panel two because we exceeded the 2.0 aspect ratio. So L2 goes on to be multiplied by an adjustment factor using the equation two times B sub S over H. Well, B sub S is the length of that panel that you're looking at, which we know is six feet. And then the height of that panel, we know uh, 16 feet. So if we just go blue here, isolate this to see what the aspect ratio adjustment factor value is, that comes out to 0.75. So you take a 25% reduction in the amount of shear wall length that you can account on, which gets you an adjusted L sub two of 4.5 feet in lieu of the original six feet. That's kind of the gist, hopefully, that you're digesting with perforated shear walls. You are permitted to use them, but then as you move through these checks, through the geometry that you have, the type of wall that you're constructing with the type of materials that you're using, you continue to kind of whittle away at the, uh, at the geometry, boiling down to a much smaller effective shear wall that you're using for your capacity in your calculations. That's, that's kind of how it goes here. Next, 
let's find our adjustment factor, C sub O. I know I was talking about all those other adjustment factors, but those were only brought on because of the conditions of the wall that we had. CO just straight up is an adjustment factor and it, it represents adjustments made based on the geometry of the openings within your perforated wall. And you'll see that here. You have two methods in order to calculate C sub O. Equations 4.3-5 and 4.3-6, or you head to the table 4335. So first off, we have a maximum opening height equal to eight feet. That's That was the height of our door in the middle of our, of our wall there. So eight feet out of 16 feet, 16 feet being the total height of our wall. That's 0 0.5, or the other way that you can say that, that maximum opening is H over two high when you're comparing that opening against the geometry of your shear wall. So that's gonna land us here. You don't need to just use an eight foot wall or a 10 foot wall to use this table. That's where at first I was tripped up on. The way that I'm understanding these two values is that they're just typical wall heights that are used over and over again in common construction so that it makes the process of going through this a little more quick. So these are almost like examples. This percentage is equal to the summation of LI over the total sum of the length of your shear wall. Well, this value we know to be 14.5 feet. The total length of our wall we know to be 24 feet. That's because that's the length of panel one of 10 feet, the length of panel two, which is six feet, and the length of the opening of eight feet. That gets you 24 feet total. That gets you a percentage equal to 0 0.604, which comes out, in other words, to 60%. Again, notice that whittling down effect that I was talking about. It's not the summation of your shear panels outright, it's your adjusted length of your shear panel. So that's why we used 14.5, not 16. I think it's 0 0.83 for our CO adjustment factor. We have two footnotes here. Number one talks about the maximum opening height shall be taken as the maximum opening clear height in a perforated shear wall where areas above and or below an opening remain unsheathed, the height of each opening shall be defined as the clear height of the opening plus the unsheathed area. This is where I was saying, hey, we are we need to specify that we're sheathed all around our openings in order to use a perforated system. However, what they are saying is if you had that door opening, but then this panel up here, say, for some reason, this zone right here was unsheathed another two feet and the original opening was eight feet. You would need to run uh, calculations for your CO based on a 10 foot opening height, not an eight foot opening height. Footnote two, the sum of the perfect shear wall segments uh, summation LI divided by the total length of perfect shear walls LT, uh, L total. Lengths of perforated shear walls segments with respect ratios greater than two to one shall be adjusted in accordance with 4343. That was what I just told you over here. You need to go and adjust your wall lengths based on uh, finding summation LI. So they just remind you there in the footnote. Always read your footnotes. Now let's solve for V sub N, which spit out 8.56 kips. Now we're uh, doing allowable forces, so we need allowable capacity. So Vn over omega from our footnote from our shear wall table. We know omega is 2.0 because we're doing allowable design. And we're gonna plug that in for Vn. 4.28 kips, which is greater than V required, equaling three kips from the problem. So we know our shear capacity is adequate for that demand. Now let's get our hold down demand. We're not gonna get capacities and, and size any type of hold downs today, but I'm gonna show you how the demand gets altered when you are designing a perforated shear wall versus a solid wall. T over C equals VH over summation LI times CO. If we just had a solid wall, we would do T, which is tension force, and then eh and force. We all know we just do T is equal to V times H, that being your moment, divided by 
your force couple, which is the distance between the, compre the centroid of the compression zone and your tension hold down device. So I just denoted that as a distance X here. This is not accurate for a perforated shear wall. You need to take a reduction in those values because you have that perforation. And that they provide in the SpidWiz with this equation. So instead of X, you take a reduced distance, summation LI times your adjustment factor CO. And that ultimately shrinks, or here, I'll draw it here in blue. That ultimately shrinks your force couple down smaller and when you divide a moment by a smaller force couple you get higher design forces for your tension and compression uh, design elements so there you go you're being more conservative because you're using a perforated system they want to ensure the system is adequate all that plugged in gets you four kips for your tension compression i am leaving out uh any type of dead load or gravity load that is either assisting or not assisting our shear wall today, I'm keeping it very simplistic. So yes, in the real world, you would have framing that is being supported most likely, uh, unless you had a non-bearing shear wall, which isn't a great idea, uh, from, you would have load criteria from the structure that is being supported by your shear wall. That would all factor in, that would go through load combos. We all know how that's done. All right, now let's get our shear demand along our sill bolts. And we also set our tension demand along our sill bolts, which uh, sill bolts, sill bolts, which kind of seems a little strange. We don't usually rely on our sill bolts for any types of tensile capacity. That's what the hold downs are for. Well, perforated shear walls, man, they have additional criteria. V max needs to be designed with uh, the equation from the SpidWiz of V over the summation L I C O. So again, instead of it just being all of the shear divided by the total length of your panel segments, you have to reduce the length of your panel segments based on uh, your L sub I and your C sub O. That gets you 250 PLF is what you need to design your sill bolts for in order to transfer your lateral forces from your wall down into your foundation. And there is one more caveat here. Perforated shear walls, they say, hey, you also need to design your sill bolts uh, for a, an, a uniform tension uplift uh, that is equivalent to your V max that you just calculated for the shear demand on your sill bolts. So V max also equals this. I'm going to call it like a little T. You also need to design for a uniform uplift force along your sill at your panel zones of T. So T equals V max, which also equals 250 PLF. And basically they're saying, well, we permitted you to use a hold down at each end and you have this big honking opening here. And if you're to push on this thing, well, those panels might start to kind of pull apart and kind of deform. Um, and now there's kind of this like hinge point and zone where you might experience additional uplift forces from uh, racking back and forth. So that seismic application going forward, back, forward, back. Um, and now there's so much damage at kind of the mid span of your panel that there's not continu uh, continuity between your hold downs. So as a caution, they've designed a continuous additional force along your entire sill, holding down your wall segments. So it helps uh, ensure that, hey, if, if there was extreme damage to this perforated shear wall, that link between your hold downs, even if that load path kind of uh, dissolves under load, you still have backup uh, hold down capacity of your shear walls. And that'll do it. Like, subscribe. Thanks for coming in here today. If you just found out the channel for the first time because you're designing something wood related, hey, consider subscribing. You don't have to though, but I would appreciate it. It's totally free. And uh, I'm glad to be back with more full length videos on design examples for all things structural engineering. This is Rich with Team Kesteva. Get out of here. It's a nice day. Catch you next time. Peace.